Hi, here's a video on the electrically short dipole. So the electrically short dipole, or as I will abbreviate it, ESD, is the simplest dipole that you encounter in common practice. So it's uh, relatively simple to analyze, and I will attempt to do that here. And uh, it's good for demonstrating some principles that apply to antennas generally. So there's the two reasons why we want to look at it. So electrically short dipole is this uh, structure shown in black here. So there's some terminals, an applied current of I0, uh, a straight uh, dipole, as we refer to it. I've got a coordinate system defined here as the z-axis. So the dipole is aligned along the z-axis. And the defining property of an electrically short dipole is that its overall length is much, much less than a wavelength. So how much less? Well, certainly by the time you're one-tenth of a wavelength long, uh, the rules I'm talking about will apply. For quarter wavelength, things are a little bit iffy. Uh, for half a wavelength, we're talking about a different kind of dipole, a half-wave dipole. That's a different topic. So electrically short means here, length much, much less than a wavelength. The current distribution on such a dipole consists of currents, which are running like this. They're all running in the same direction because the dipole is so short, there's not enough space there to see multiple directions at the same time. The current is maximum at the terminals and goes to zero at the ends. So this is a triangular distribution of current. The magnitude is zero at uh, either end, it's maximum in the middle. The resulting electric field intensity, when I say electric field intensity, I mean the electric field in units of volts per meter, is given by this expression, theta hat, that's referring to the polarization of the electric field, J eta. Eta is the wave impedance of free space, which is 377 ohms. I naught, there's where the current's coming in. Beta times L. Beta is the phase propagation constant. That's 2 pi over lambda. That has units of radians per meter in SI base uh, over 8 pi. Uh, sine theta. There is what we refer to as the pattern factor. That's saying that the electric field intensity is greatest in the broadside direction, and it goes to zero along the z-axis. So we say there's a null along the z-axis. In the far field, we see a spherical wave. So there's the e to the minus j beta r over r dependence. That is, the, uh, uh, that is a characteristic of all spherical waves. And then once again, just to emphasize, uh, theta is the angle measured from the z-axis. Because we're eventually going to want directivity, we want to compute the uh, power density. Uh, the power density at some position r, that's uh, in the far field anyway, that's given by the magnitude of the electric field intensity squared divided by 2 times the wave impedance. We have everything we need to do to do that. We have the electric field expression here, so we can do that calculation. And we find we get eta times the magnitude of the current squared, beta L squared, over 128 pi squared, Here's the pattern factor, sine theta squared, and then 1 over r squared. Of course, we expect to see that 1 over r squared because we expect to see the inverse square law uh, apply to uh, spherical waves. And of course, the SI base units for power density are watts over meters squared. We also want to know the radiated power. This will become important when we need, um, when we want to compute the impedance. The way we do that is we take the spatial power density, we integrate over a sphere in the far field. So if we take watts per meter squared and integrate over an area, we get watts, that's the radiated power. Doing that, we get eta, magnitude of the current squared, beta L squared, over 48 pi. That has SI base units of watts. Because we are going to be interested in directivity, we also want to know the average power density. That's the power density averaged over all directions. That is simply the radiated power divided by 4 pi r squared, which is the area of a sphere. So we do that, we get this expression. And that has units of watts per meter squared. So we have everything we need here to compute the directivity. So 
Let's get to it. Directivity is defined as power density divided by average power density. We just do that calculation and we get 1.5 times sine theta squared. If we make a picture of this, here's the z-axis. That's also the axis of the dipole. Uh, so uh, the sine theta is this thing. All right, so we see maximum directivity broadside. And the power density is evidently 1.5 times isotropic in that direction. So the maximum power density is 1.5 times isotropic. The minimum power density, which is what we see along the axis, is zero. And that's what this uh, line is saying. Of course, we like to see directivity expressed in dBi normally. We simply take 10 log 10 of 1.5, and we find that the directivity of an electrically short dipole is about 1.8 dBi, whereas isotropic would be 0 dBi. So that's it. An electrically short dipole is just a little bit more directive uh, than an isotropic antenna, except, of course, we have these nulls along the uh, axis of the dipole. Next, let's look at impedance. The impedance in general is the sum of the radiation resistance, the loss resistance, and the um, reactance. So, radiation resistance, as usual, is related to radiated power by this expression. Simply square of the current times the radiation resistance and take one half. That means the radiation resistance is just two times the radiated power divided by the magnitude of the current squared. We have an expression for the radiated power. So we find that we get for the radiation resistance eta times beta L squared over 24 pi. Of course, we can go further. Uh, beta is 2 pi over lambda, and uh, eta is uh, 377 ohms, but 377 ohms is very, very close to 120 pi. So we make those substitutions, and we find out that the radiation resistance of an electrically short dipole is about 20 pi squared ohms times the length of the dipole relative to a wavelength squared. So nice simple expression for that. The loss resistance you can calculate. This is an expression uh, that you have probably encountered in some form in electromagnetic theory courses. Uh, the loss resistance of this thing is length divided by 6 times the uh, radius times the square root of uh, the permeability times frequency divided by pi divided again by uh, conductivity. So, how important is this? Uh, the loss resistance is not necessarily uh, much, much less than the radiation resistance. In other words, you can't necessarily ignore it. Not because the loss resistance is big, but because this expression, you will see, gives you pretty small values of radiation resistance, maybe just a few ohms. So, if the loss resistance is tens of milliohms or hundreds of milliohms, then the loss resistance is going to be important. And if it's important, then some fraction, some significant fraction of the power that could have been radiated will instead get turned into heat. And we recognize this using a term known as radiation efficiency. In other words, if the loss resistance is much, much less than the radiation resistance, then the overwhelming fraction of power accepted by the antenna goes into the radio wave, and we say we have high radiation efficiency. If, on the other hand, the loss resistance is significant compared to the radiation resistance, then relatively little of the uh, power accepted by the antenna ends up in the radiated wave. It's wasted in heat in the dipole. We have low radiation efficiency. And then the uh, reactance, uh, X sub A, um, that's a little bit difficult to analyze uh, at the level of detail we're going to do it here. I will simply show you what it looks like, and it looks like this. The vertical axis is reactance. It can be positive or negative, of course. The length of the antenna is the horizontal axis. If the antenna is very, very small, then what we find is that the reactance is very, very large and negative. Uh, just think of an unterminated transmission line. An unterminated transmission line has a reactance uh, of minus j infinity. It looks like a very small capacitor. So as length increases, something begins to happen. Uh, it gets, uh, uh, it starts heading towards positive territory, but in the uh, electrically short dipole domain, we never really quite get there. Even for a dipole that's a quarter wavelength, we'll never quite get to um, the positive reactance territory. 
So what we see for electric short dipoles is reactances in this uh, ballpark. So here's an example. If we choose a length of one-tenth of a wavelength, that's certainly electrically short. We obtain a impedance for this antenna of 2, that's the radiation resistance, this is approximate values by the way, uh, 2 ohms. The radiation loss depends, but it's typically somewhere on the order of tens to hundreds of milliohms, depending on the material you use. And the reactance is big and negative. Uh, so for a tenth of a wavelength, typically something like minus uh, 2 kilo ohms. So the consequence of that is impedance matching which is very, very difficult for electrically short dipoles. Let's just ignore uh, the loss resistance here for a moment, which is conceivable. We could use a metal which is of such high conductivity that the loss resistance is not uh, significant, at least relative to the radiation resistance. In that case, the antenna impedance will be 2 minus J2000 ohms. So over here we have that we have uh, 2 minus J 2000 ohms and we want to match that to a typical transmitter. So a typical transmitter we can represent as a, a Thevenin equivalent circuit which has a typical output impedance, we'll say in this case 50 ohm. Not because all such transmitters have 50 ohm output impedance but many do and it's a useful case. So if we want to match these two things uh, what you see is you first have to compensate for this large negative reactance. And the way you do that is by adding large positive reactants. So those are going to be two inductors, uh, two relatively large inductors. Uh, you might ask, why two? Why not just put in one plus J2000 ohm um, reactants? And that's because uh, the electrically short dipole is intrinsically balanced. That is... As a device, it doesn't really have a ground and a signal lead. It has two signal leads, and um, we say the signal is uh, differential. So the natural way to do this, then, is to split any reactants that we use for matching across the two leads, and that's why we, we describe it this way. So looking in from this direction now, we've taken care of the reactants. Now we're trying to match 2 ohms to 50 ohms. Uh, one way to do that is with a transformer. That transformer would have a 25 to 1 impedance ratio. Uh, that would less match 50 ohms to 2 ohms. Another reason for using the transformer here is that that would also serve as a ballon. A ballon is a device which transforms balanced impedances into single-ended impedances. And as I've shown it here, and is often the case, transmitters tend to be single-ended, at least Many of them are. Um, so I can accomplish two things at once here. By using a transformer to do this job, I can do both the transformation of the real valued part of the impedance as well as the differential to single ended conversion. So finally, let me note one more thing here, and that's that this impedance matching scheme is going to result in a very high Q circuit. And we know that when we have high Q, we can expect very narrow bandwidth. So one of the problems with electrically short dipoles is that not only are they kind of quirky and difficult to match, but once you get them matched, the match that you end up with has very, very narrow bandwidth. And that can be a problem um, if you have a system which has a large tuning range, for example. So there are the features of an electrically short dipole. That concludes this lecture.